it's a pleasure to have um, Artem Kotelsky, um, who will tell us today about Kavanaugh homology via immersed curves. Yes. Hi, everyone. And uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Actually, I have one quick question. Uh, one more quick question. Are there 60 minutes for a talk? Yes. So, um, so you have up to 60 minutes plus, um, plus Q&A afterwards, plus informal discussion. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation. So I will be talking about quantum homology via immersed curves. And this is joint work with uh, Liam Watson and Claudio Zibrovius. So before I describe the framework of immersed curves and how they help with Kavanaugh homology, I want to cover some background on Kavanaugh homology. Uh, so briefly, uh, Kavanaugh homology is a not invariant um, in the form of a bigraded uh, K vector space where K is any field. And one grading is called quantum grading and another grading is called homological. And it is due to Kavanov in 2000, in the year of 2000. Um, so uh, one of the notable features of this homology theory for a knot is that its construction is combinatorial. So for example, there's, uh, there are others like Hegar fleur knot fleur homology and Islington fleur homology. Those constructions are more geometric either symplectic geometric or gauge theoretic. Whereas this one is really combinatorial based on diagrams. So a key property of quantum homology is that it categorifies Jones polynomial. So it's an, it's an invariant which strengthens Jones polynomial. And uh, we'll be interested actually in the reduced version with this twiddle. Um, it's a variation of Kavanaugh homology, very kind of closely related to unreduced version. And to give you several examples, uh, reduced quantum homology of a non-knot is one dimensional. Reduced quantum homology of trefoil is three dimensional. And uh, reduced quantum homology of a figure eight knot is five dimensional. And uh, I'll show you some more examples later as well. And let me mention sort of why uh, quantum homology is interesting. One of the major applications is uh, a construction of concordance variant invariant S of K. It's an integer value concordance invariant. It was constructed by Rasmussen and um, it's a lower bound for the four ball genus, for the slice genus. And uh, he used this concordance in there. He used this lower bound to prove that a naughty number of P Q torus naught is one over two P minus one Q minus one. That's a Milner's conjecture. And this was the first combinatorial proof, whereas the previous ones used monopole fluoromology or Hegar fluoromology. So this is uh, really one of the major applications of commonology, why it is interesting. Um, so now let me turn to uh, let, let me describe kind of a close cousin of quantum homology. Uh, it's called Barnton homology. Sometimes it is also called S1 equivariant quantum homology. And I'll describe it by comparing one to another. It is due to Barnton in 2005. So if quantum homology, reduced quantum homology of trefoil is three dimensional and the bigrading is described here, uh, yeah, by the way, I didn't say, if there, are, if there are questions, please interrupt me and I will be really happy to answer. Um, so yeah, so here's the bigrading on these three dimensions. Uh, you know, this, for example, generating the bigrading zero, two, and et cetera. So this is how homology of trefoil looks like. Um, so Barnetan homology, on the other hand, what changes is that um, we start working over a polynomial ring rather than just a field. And also differential gets deformed by certain uh, terms picking up powers of H. So what happens for trefoil is that you can uh, view uh, bind homology of trefoil as uh, three, three uh, polynomial rings in the same bigradings, and then there's a, a deformed differential here picking up H. And then if you take homology of that, 
uh, what, uh, what one obtains is basically this tower, which corresponds to a polynomial ring, and also one generator, which uh, corresponds to this module. Okay, so that's the Barnett module for trefoil. And really, this is the main variant on which we will concentrate um, in our framework. Um, and uh, let me also mention that the two are connected, uh, and the two are connected by a mapping cone. Uh, so reduced Klein homology is a mapping cone, uh, is homology of a mapping cone where um, this map is given by multiplication by H. Yeah, so the Barnett homology is a module over this ring, and so that, that's why th there is this map multiplication by H. Okay, um, so next I want to talk about uh, symplectic Kavanaugh homology. Um, and uh, the motivational questions behind symplectic Kavanaugh homology is the following. Uh, the not invariant Kavanaugh homology is defined combinatorially uh, and other Kavanaugh, uh, sorry, other not homologies are defined geometrically. So there's a natural, uh, very natural question. Are there uh, geometric or topological viewpoints on Kavan homology? Perhaps reformulations are the ways to define it, which kind of shed light on what Kavan homology really is. And um, there's, there are several works in this direction. So there's an algebra geometric interpretation using coherent shifts. Uh, due to Kautis and Kamenitzer. There's also a gauge theoretic proposal, uh, which is due to Witten. Um, and uh, most relevant to us, there's also floor theoretic description of uh, unreduced Kavan, of actually reduced as well, Kavan homology over Q, uh, which is due to Seidel Smith, uh, who conjectured this in interpretation and Manolescu and Abu Zaid Smith. And let me describe this construction a little bit because it is connected to the construction that I will be talking later. Um, basically, uh, the way it works is that one starts with an Enbridge decomposition of a knot. Uh, so Enbridge decomposition is uh, decomposition of a knot into two tangles, T1 and T2 along a sphere which intersects the knot in two end points, such that the height function has only maximums for T1 and the height function has only minimums for T2. So that's the end bridge decomposition of a knot. And once, uh, once one fixes that, then um, the construction associates to the two N marked sphere, certain moduli space uh, symplectic manif open symplectic manifold of dimension 4n. And inside this symplectic manifold, two Lagrangians, one associated to uh, tangle T1 and the, the other associated to the tangle T2. Um, both Lagrangians are products of two spheres. So S2 to the power n, and this one is also S2 to the power n. And so the output uh, is that uh, Kvan homology of K uh, can be recovered as Lagrangian floor homology of the two Lagrangians. Okay, so uh, now uh, let me shift gears a little bit. Um, uh, first question, what are possible implications of symplectic Kvan homology? And there's one answer which is, uh, which, which basically says that whenever you have a geometric description of uh, Kavanaugh homology, uh, uh, the construction of equivariant Kavanaugh homology becomes uh, very natural. And so you can use this geometric uh, description to actually define equivariant Kavanaugh homology. And this is due to Seidel Smith and Hendricks, Lipschitz and Sarkar. Um, and uh, uh, let me say that 
one of the difficulties in kind of pushing further applications of symplectic cohomology is in the fact that the moduli space M of S to N is um, fairly complicated. It's, a, it's an open space inside a Hilbert scheme of a certain Milner fiber and uh, its dimension is 4N. Um, so that's kind of the motivation behind, uh, you know, our construction, one of the motivations. So because of this difficulty, let me now change the perspective a little bit. And uh, here's how. Uh, basically, I want to now assume that n is equal to 2, that my knot is really uh, divided uh, into two tangles along a sphere which intersects the knot into in four points. Such a sphere is uh, sometimes called a Conway sphere. Uh, so that's the first point. And the second point is that I don't want to now require T1 and T2 to be trivial. So I do not require this to be a two bridge decomposition. So this tangle can be arbitrarily complicated and this tangle as well. And this is just an example. Okay, so this is gonna be my topological setup. Um, and uh, the goal now becomes the following. I want to interpret Barnton homology and Cavano homology, both reduced, um, as Reptler homology of immersed curves inside the Conway sphere itself. Um, and uh, kind of the interesting point is that the Conway, the dimension of Conway sphere is of course two, and it is lower than eight or four. So eight would be the dimension of this moduli space, whereas eight, whereas four would be the dimension to expect if we would do reduced version of symplectic command moduli. But we work on, uh, with dimension two and kind of philosophical reason uh, for this is because we're working on the uh, first reduced and then also S1 equivariant level. So we're recovering Barnton homology rather than Kavana uh, uh, homology. So that's why uh, kind of the construction works in the dimension two. Uh, so uh, perhaps I'll pause uh, for a moment. Next up, I will go into uh, the construction of uh, you know, the construction of this Repler homology interpretation. Are there any questions? Okay, so I'll move on. Um, so first, I need to describe you curve invariance in order to describe how this works. Um, the curve invariance, uh, work as follows. So the input is a pointed four-ended tangle. So what do I mean by pointed? I mean that one of the four ends will be marked by a star uh, and asterisk. And this is really done to uh, reduce the knot, okay? And so this is an example of a four-ended tangle. And the four-ended tangle lives inside a three disk. And the output uh, of, uh, of the construction of our construction is two tangle invariants. Uh, gamma bar, bar, the Barnatan curve and Kavanov curve. And each of them is a collection of bigraded in an appropriate sense, oriented um, immersed curves with local systems on the four puncture sphere. And this four puncture sphere comes as a boundary of the tangle. Okay. And um, so the construction is rather lengthy. So I will, I will describe it a little bit later. Um, and for now, I want to talk about examples and properties. So here's the first example. The first example is uh, for a trivial tangle. So this is a trivial tangle, consists of two uh, strands inside it. So the Barnatan curve is here. It consists of uh, basically just one simple arc 
like this, okay? And uh, Kabanov curve consists of uh, a figure eight, okay? And actually the local system for this figure eight is minus one, but I will suppress uh, uh, sort of the bigrading or, um, orientation and local systems from the exposition, okay? So uh, the Barnatan curve is an arc, Kavanov curve is a figure eight. So next example, I want to talk about the three twist tangle. So the three twist tangle obtained for, is obtained from trivial tangle by a braid move, right? Three braid moves. So one obtains the three twist tangle and uh, well, the Barnatan curve is again an arc and uh, it looks like this. Kavanov curve is again a figure eight and it looks like this. And you can notice that this curve and this curve are obtained from these curves by applying the same braid move. And indeed, this is a general property of this invariance. Okay. Uh, and so here's a more complicated examples. Both of these tangles are rational, uh, but this tangle is not. This is a two minus three pretzel tangle. And as you see, the invariants for this tangle are more complicated. Uh, Barnett-Town curve is still one arc, but it is already not embedded, but an immersed arc. Looks, uh, I drew it here. And um, Kavanov curve is also interesting. And you can see that it's not a figure eight based on this arc as one might expect from these two examples, right? It's actually two curves. So one component is this blue one and another component is this blue one, okay? And actually both of them are figure eights. This is, this purple one is a figure eight and the blue one is also a figure eight kind of which winds around twice like this, okay? So these are examples of this curve invariance. And let me now kind of generalize some of the properties that we see here. So what would be properties of this curve invariance? So the first property is that Barnatan curve is always of the form one arc and some other compact, comp compact curves, okay? I mean, in these three examples, it's always one arc, but for more complicated examples, uh, there's gonna be other compact curves. And now let me say that this property is basic, is kind of an analogy of the fact that Lee homology is trivial for the knot. So for four-ended tangle, this is the property that one gets. Um, and the next one is that the Kavanov curve um, e consists of only compact components. So you see that all these three in the all these three examples, uh, they consist of compact components, and in general, Kavanov curve always will have only compact components. So the other one is something I already touched, uh, touched on, mapping class group naturality. So if you apply a braid move to the curve, is this, you know, the result will be the same as if you took a curve of the tangle to which you applied the braid move, right? And this is illustrated on these two examples. Uh, so you go from, one goes from uh, this trivial tangle to this using three twists. And the same is true for, for example, you go from this arc to this arc, again, using three braid twists. So this mapping cl class group action really commutes with taking curve invariance. And this we proved only over F2 because the signs, uh, pinning down the signs is complicated in the proof. And actually, for this implies that for rational tangles, so the rational tangles are those who which are which are obtained from a trivial tangle by doing any any braid moves. These are rational tangles, and this is an example of a rational tangles. Rational tangle for rational tangles, the curves are actually rather simple. Well, the curves over uh, the field of two elements. Uh, the the Barnetton curve is obtained from the tangle R 
by pushing the unmarked components i into the boundary sphere. So I'm taking this unmarked component and I'm pushing it to the boundary and I am obtaining Barnett-Town curve. Likewise here, if I take this component and I push it to the boundary, I will get this arc. And I push it in such a way that it doesn't intersect the other, doesn't intersect the other component. Our time, you have a question from Michael Hutchings. Uh-huh. Um, and Michael, you can, you can. That's right, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I was just asking what, what you mean when you talk about curves over F2, is that, is that something about the local coefficient systems? Yeah, so in particular, local coefficients uh, systems are with that, uh, you know, uh, uh, with coefficients that field. But what I really mean, I guess, is that the, the construction of these curves are algebraic, and I will go over that construction. And in that construction, one has to choose a field. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, basically I will answer that question shortly, maybe in five minutes. Yeah. Um, and so now let me say that Kavanov curve is obtained from this arc simply by substituting it with a figure eight. And actually also uh, to, uh, you know, a comment which is related to your question is that this curve invariance, they actually do depend on the field K and uh, we will see how, how that works. This is, um, one should think of this as the fact, as an analogy to the fact that Kavanaugh homology actually also depends on the field. Uh, this is something actually very specific to Kavanaugh homology because for, for example, not for homology doesn't seem to depend on the field, uh, although it is not proved. So these were the properties uh, that I wanted to talk about. And so now, before I go into constructions of, construction of this curve, let me actually state the theorem that towards which uh, I'm describing this framework. So uh, here's the main theorem. Um, suppose a node K is, de is decomposed along a Conway sphere. So we're in this setup uh, that I'm, I'm describing. So K is a union of two tangles, T1 and T2, along a Conway sphere. And actually, let me immediately give you an example so that you have a picture in mind. Suppose your knot is actually decomposed along a four puncture sphere. The claim is that then reduced Barnatan homology as well as reduced Kavano homology as by graded K vector spaces are isomorphic to Repfler homology of the curves associated to the two tangles. So I have one tangle, and so I'm taking a curve associated to that tangle. And then I have another tangle. I'm taking the curve associated to that tangle. And I'm taking Repfler homology of that, and I'm obtaining Barnett-Tan homology. Now notice, to obtain Barnett-Tan homology, I need to take both curves to be Barnett-Tan type. So remember, there are two types of curves. One is Barnett-Tan type, and another is Kavanov type. And so in order to obtain reduced Kavanov homology, I want to take one curve to be Kavanov type and another curve to be Barnett-Tan type. So let me immediately illustrate it on an example. Here's a decomposition of an unknot into two trivial tangles. So how to obtain Barnett-Tan homology of an unknot? Well, I'm taking the inner tangle and I'm associating its uh, to it, its Barnett-Tan curve, which this is this arc, and I'm taking this um, outside tangle and I'm associating to this outside tangle, it's invariant, which is also an arc. But here's an interesting thing. We have to take Refler homology. So we have to wrap one of the arcs. So that's why the red arc is actually wrapped. So one obtains this infinite amount of intersections. And this corresponds to the fact that Barnett-Tan homology of a non-knot is, uh, is a polynomial ring in H. Uh, so it, it also has infinite number of generators. And you see that if, if I take Barn, uh, Kavanov type for the outside tangle, so I'm taking Kavanov type curve here, 
right? This is gamma KH and this is gamma Varnatan. Then I've got only one intersection if I take Refler homology between them and that corresponds to one dimensional reduced Kalana homology of a trap, oh, uh, sorry, of an unknot. So that's the, uh, the, the main statement. And let me uh, give you two more examples. Um, so one example is trefoil. And uh, you can see um, here the intersection, P, the intersection fluoromology consists of only Barnetan curves, so two arcs, one arc like this and one arc like this. I wrap the red, uh, the red one and I, I obtain a polynomial ring KH and also one extra intersection. And that corresponds to this extra generator in the Barnetan homology of the trefoil. And this intersection floor, floor picture, one, one can see these three, uh, three generators and the three generators correspond to the three dimensional um, common homology of the trefoil. Again, I'm, I'm, instead of the arc, I'm substituting in with a figure eight on one side. And actually, uh, you, one could also substitute, instead of the red one, one could substitute the blue one and the theorem would be uh, still true. So it doesn't matter which one you substitute by, Barn, by a Kalanov curve. And just to uh, show one, one more complicated example, for four minus three torus knot where the inner tangle is complicated, the outside is rational, one again, you know, obtains the right answers. Reduce common homology of the, this four minus three torus knot is five dimensional and well, Barnton homology is, uh, has sort of three torsion generators and a tower of polynomial ring. So these are the examples and the main theorem. So now I will go into construction of these curves. How to actually construct, you know, having this inside tangle, how do I construct the, uh, this, cur this blue curve? This is what I'm gonna talk next. But uh, are there any questions so far perhaps? Um, hi Artem, yes, I had one question. I was mm -hmm. wondering um, in the main theorem, um, does the main theorem also explain, so So when you write these isomorphisms of Barnetan homology, you're mm -hmm. sort of implicitly writing an isomorphism as a K adjoin H module. So you're, there's a K adjoin H module action. Um, does this wrapped Fleur homology perspective, um, you know, have a source of that? Actually, yes. So uh, um, indeed. So uh, on one side, Barnetan homology is a module. And it is a very natural question to wonder, okay, how do I recover this module structure on this side? And this is a work in progress, but uh, a short answer is that one should count index two disks of this type covering punctures. So if you count index two disks covering punctures, you get this module structure. So for example, uh, for the four minus three torus knot, if you take um, yes, if you take this generator and this generator, there is an index two disc which covers this puncture. And this corresponds to the fact that if this is X, this is gonna be H times X. But actually the way you should count them is very particular. One cannot count all of them. One should count only some of them. And this corresponds to the fact that index two discs come in one parameter family. So one, hand, one has to restrict this part one parameter family and then count them and then it works. And this is work in progress. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. thanks for the question. Other questions? I have a question. Um, so for, for your, this floor homology, are you basically just looking at the minimum number of intersections of the curves after isotopies? Yes, as long as curves are not isotopic to each other. And whenever uh, two curves are isotopic to each other, one has to, well, one has to um, take into account local systems. 
So the way, uh, it, basically, uh, you know, if they are isotopic, the picture is going to be like this. And there's going to be one disk here and another disk here computing, contributing to Lagrangian flow emoji. And one has to account for the local systems to understand what is the flare emoji. There's a formula using the local systems. But yes, if, if the curves are not isotopic, then it's, it's just a minimal intersection number, modular wrapping. So one has to wrap, and then after wrapping, it is a minimal intersection number. Sorry, can you glue two forended tangles in two points to get another forended tangle and get some kind of multiplication operation? Uh, yes. Uh, you can, but I, uh, I don't know a geometric meaning of that operation. So algebraically you can, uh, but I'm not sure, I don't know how to describe it geometrically. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a definitely a good question. Okay. Uh, so let me continue. Ah, yes, uh, a, a remark, I'm sorry. A, uh, remark is that there's a third type of immersed curve and the third type, you know, allows to recover reduced cohomology. Uh, oh, sorry, unreduced cohomology. But I don't want to uh, talk about that since it's just gonna, uh, yeah, it's, there's gonna be too many types of curves. I, I, I will only concentrate on Barneton and reduced cohomology. But there's a third type as well. So now I want to talk about construction of this curves invariant. Um, and this is really the key of the, uh, the, the crux of the matter. And it goes in, in three steps. So I start with a four ended tangle T. Then I construct uh, a basically a twisted complex. Then I construct another twisted complex. And then I get a curve. And here's how it works. So step one is, uh, is done basically using cube of resolutions. So immediately I give an example. If, you, if one has just one crossing, just a simple tangle like this, one, one uh, takes the cube of resolution approach and one gets well, zero resolution and one resolution and a saddle cobordism between them. And it's clear you, one can do it for any diagram, right? And the question is, how do I interpret this diagram? And work of uh, Barnatan, and also one can understand it from, from the for other viewpoint of Kavanov, from the work of Kavanov and Mannion, um, um, they basically allow you to understand this uh, cabordism, sort of cube of resolution and cabordisms on edges as a chain complex, or uh, perhaps in, in simplex geometric terms, twisted complex. And, it, and we denote this twisted complex by double bracket T. It is considered up to homotopy. And the kind of the technical proposition that we will use is that this, uh, this object is a twisted complex over deformed reduced arc algebra. And uh, yeah, instead of so, sort of explaining how to define arc algebra, how to kind of obtain arc algebra from four ended sphere, for Mark sphere, let me just uh, describe it to you by this quiver. So this is the algebra that I will work with. Um, these are two vertices correspond to two trivial tangles. And then there is kind of uh, four basic morphisms. These are saddles and these correspond to dot cobordisms. And then there's relations. The relations are that if, if one composes D with S's in any order, one gets zero. Um, and this is kind of the, one of the key objects that we will, we will be working with. This is a, a quiver algebra over any field K. Um, and so uh, here, th this is uh, the point where the field K plays a role because one can define this twisted complex over any field. And so what comes next is an observation. And this is the key observation um, that this algebra B 
uh, embeds into the wrapped uh, Fukai category of the four punctured sphere. Um, so how does this work? Uh, so what I claim is the following. So this is this picture is supposed to represent four punctured sphere. Here's this. These are four punctures, and I'm considering two arcs, a circle and a bullet, and I claim that if I only consider these two arcs, rep Fukai category based on these two arcs is going to be precisely this algebra. And uh, this basically follows from the core description of the rep Fukai category. So I'm, I, have to I have to kind of denote all the chords. This is chord D2, chord S1, chord, chord S2, chord D1. And then there is a description of the rep Fukai, Fukai category in terms of chords. And it, is preci it precisely looks like this, where the relations, for example, D S equals zero, corresponds to the fact that, for example, this chord doesn't concatenate with this. But for example, S1 times S2 is not zero because these two chords do concatenate with each other. And so the upshot is that this algebra embeds into the Rad Fukai category. And so now uh, I want to kind of, this step two is, uh, is merely notational, but it is powerful as well because on this side, I have a really kind of a quantum topological uh, not invariant. But once I change the generators, so these generators I change for a circle and this type of generators I change for a bullet, once I do that, now this is still a twisted complex, but now this is a twisted complex in the realm of geometry. So this step two is how, I, how we go from kind of quantum topology to symplectic geometry. And, but, uh, you know, on the level of objects, it's simply just uh, substitute this generator with this generator and this generator with this generator, and one gets a twisted complex. <clears throat> so that's step two. And uh, now I want to describe the, the last step, the step three, and also a pairing theorem. So step three is based on a theorem of Haydn, Kosarkov, Konsevich. Basically, yeah, their theorem uh, gives exactly what we want. It says that homotopy classes of twisted complexes over the Rev Fukai category of a surface are in one to one correspondence uh, with, well, actually, I, sh I should put here homotopy classes of immersed curves equipped with local systems. And local systems are with coefficients in the field that we chose. And this, in this process, field does matter. Uh, so it, at, this, at this point, uh, you know, if we work over a field of F2 or over rationals, our curves may actually differ the resulting curves. So uh, it's a great theorem because it allows to kind of go from algebra to geometry, because here we have a twisted complex and now we have an immersed curve. And uh, yeah, let me say that they proved it uh, in a represent uh, using representation theory of nets. And uh, if one wants to, yeah, I think it's doable. No, I think, yes, I think it's doable. Since this is the first time. Oh, uh, say it again, please. I didn't quite understand your question. Could you? I, I think maybe Barish didn't mean to be unmuted. Uh, did you have oh, a question, okay. Barish? Okay. okay. Um, so let's continue. Yeah, uh, it's a great theorem. It's proved using representation theorem nets. And if one has a chain complex but wants to understand what's the curve, then it's actually hard to use their framework of representation theory. So another framework in the paper of Hanselman, Rasmus, and Watson was developed uh, using train tracks. And they, they reproved their theorem in a special case. And we also, uh, you know, we generalized uh, basically their, their approach to arbitrary coefficients and arbitrary surfaces. And this actually allows curve invariance to be computable. 
So starting with the tangle, we can actually compute the curve. And the algorithm was implemented by Zebrovis and China, and it works. It's on GitHub. It's kind of nice. Um, and uh, let me say that what we did also is that we enhanced their theorem by proving uh, correspond correspondence between not only twisted complexes and curves, but also uh, kind of on the morphism level, there's morphism space between two twisted complexes. And we proved that this morphism space is actually homotopy equivalent to the Repfler homology of two curves. Um, so th this basically takes their theorem to the morphism level. And this, uh, uh, this kind of, this theorem allowed us to conclude with the pairing theorem. This is the, this is the reason behind the pairing theorem. So that's a, uh, a rough sketch of how the construction works and how the pairing theorem works. And uh, yes, so next I want to talk about the construction of KH type of curve, because right now I only explain how to construct Barnett-Tan curve. But it is, as a, it is actually important to also construct cage curve as well. But before that, are there any questions perhaps about the proof? I had one question. Um, can you say anything about what was involved when you generalized um, the Hanselman, Rasmussen, Watson stuff to more general fields? Um, yeah, there, there are certain moves. So when, whenever you have the so-called uh, crossover arrows in in the uh, sort uh, sort of so the way it works is that you know one starts with a chain complex and then one gets a train track first and then from train track one goes to a curve and when one has a train track there are uh, there are certain crossover arrows on that train track and one wants to be able to manipulate them around. And uh, they figured out moves corresponding to uh, to F two element field, and what we had to do is to just work out those moves over over a general field. It's not as hard, but there are more moves actually, so one has to be careful to pin, if one wants to uh, pin down the signs as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Um, so let me now uh, kind of sketch the construction of Kovanov curve. And uh, this, in this construction, the key is this element H. It's a particular element in this algebra B, which corresponds to the full chord. So there's this full chord D1 and then S1, S2, and then D2. And this is this element, the sum of this, all these full chords. And so the way the construction works is that if this is the construction of Barnett-Tan curve, at this stage, what one wants to do is take a mapping cone with respect to this element H. So it's it's very similar to the way reduced cone homology is a mapping cone on Barnett-Tan homology. And then you know one applies HKK uh, result and gets the Kavanov curve. And so, for example, if 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 I have a trivial tangle. The chain complex is just one generator. And so I get just one arc for the Barnettan curve. But if I want the Kavanov curve, Kavanov type curve, I want to take the mapping cone. And so this is be this becomes the mapping cone on D2, S2, S1. So the two full chords. And then as a result, I get the curve, which consists of two generators connected by Uh, connected by the chords D2 and S2, S1. This, this is how the construction works for Kavanov curve. And yes, actually on the previous uh, slide, I also didn't mention uh, sort of for this saddle uh, chain complex, what happens is that I take you know, how to construct the curve from this type D structure, sorry, uh, twist the complex, well, one takes this generator A circle, takes to this generator A bullet, and then connects by the chord S1. So this is roughly how the correspondence between chain complexes and curves works. 
Uh, but actually, it's more, more, much more complicated because chain complexes, you know, they are not kind of of curve type in general. They can be really complicated. So it's not as, as easy as in this example. Okay. So now I wanted to also talk about some further work. So this is what we've done uh, actually exactly one year ago. Um, and uh, uh, now... I, I want to kind of explain what are we working on right now. And the overall goal is to apply immersed curves to different tangle replacement questions. And uh, just to give you some, just to explain motivation, two, two questions that are, two product, two questions that we're working on right now are the following. So the first conjecture is that the Kavan homology is with coefficients in Q is preserved by mutation. What is mutation? Mutation is consists of taking out a four-ended tangle out of uh, out of a knot, and then rotating it by one hundred and eighty degrees. This flip, and then gluing it back. So this is what's a mutation. And the conjecture, supported by many many computations, is that cohomology is preserved by mutation. So, and you see, it is precisely tangle replacement question because I take this tangle and I replace it with this tangle. And another conjecture, which goes by the name generalized cosmetic crossing conjecture can be stated as follows. Assuming the equator on the right is not compressible. So I assume that my knot looks like this. So there's this tangle T could be really complicated, but assume that this equator is not compressible. So there is no uh, there's no disk which bounds this equator. Uh, so the, the claim is that the, fa uh, the family Kn, so the, all the knots in this family, no matter how much I twist here, and here I can have one twist or three twists or five twists or minus one twist. So the kind of the, the prototypical example is minus one twist versus one twist, right? This is a kind of change in crossing, but it's called generalized because I consider any number of twists. So not, min not only minus one and one, but all numbers, all integer numbers. The claim is that all these knots are different. Um, and yeah, some cases are known, for example, for fiber knots. Oh, uh, sorry, no, for about this conjecture, I don't know. because. Uh, the cosmetic, uh, you know, one is distinguished from minus one for fiber knots, but in general, this conjecture is wide open. And indeed, you see that it is a tangle replacement uh, kind of question because I take out this tangle and I replace it with another. So if there is like one twist, I replace it with three twists. And so the key uh, kind of how we approach this is we want to distinguish uh, for example, distinguish these knots by Kavan homology. And for that, we need to really answer geography question in, in this framework. What kind of immersed curves can be components of Kavanov curve? Uh, in, the in, the in the sense that if arbitrary curve can be an invariant of a tangle, then it's going to be very hard to uh, prove restriction, re uh, prove a result like this, right? But if I know that the Kavanov curve only looks in a, you know, in a, in this in this simple way, then it actually it becomes tractable to so to try to solve this conjecture. So that's the question that I want to concentrate for the remaining ten minutes. And so the way I answer it is that I consider uh, a cover. So the four puncture sphere has, um, you know, is a quotient by the hyper, by the elliptical involution of the torus. And then I can pass to the cover R2 without integer points. And so I can study immersed curves in the four, in the four punctures here using their lifts to this cover. And so for example, this figure eight, which corresponds to the trivial tangle actually lifts to this curve. 
And so this becomes a really fruitful viewpoint on this course. Once you do that for sufficient amount of tangles, one actually starts to notice, uh, we noticed a pattern, and here's the pattern that we noticed, that all the curves are linear, okay? And linear means that their lift just goes in one direction. The derivative is arbitrarily close to a constant. So the curve gamma delta just goes into one direction, uh, except it can kind of go between the punctures, but that's why I said arbitrarily close to constant, not a constant, okay? And the theorem that we have right now, which is in our work in progress, is that all components of the Kavanaugh type curve are linear. So whatever tangle we take, uh, so yeah, in other words, curves organize the sem themselves along lines. And these lines are kind of hard to view on the four puncture sphere, but once you pass to the cover, it becomes sort of clear what's going on, what are the lines and how they organize themselves. So here's an example uh, of sort of a more complicated tangle. So this is this two minus three pretzel tangle, and you see a Barnaton curve here and Kavanaugh type curve here. And you see that Barnaton curve is not linear because it changes direction in, the, in its lift. One cannot isotope this uh, curve to be linear. Whereas Kavanaugh curve consists of two components and both components are linear. So the orange component is linear of slope one over two actually, right? And the other component is of slope uh, zero, right? This blue component. And you can see that it's kind of hard, hard to see on this picture, but it is very clear on this covering picture. Okay. And, uh, and the question becomes, okay, how do we prove this? And it turns out that the way to uh, tackle this kind of a fruitful way to tackle this is the following. First, one, wants, one notices that, you know, and yes, by the way, this example confirms that Barnaton curve is not necessarily linear, but the Kavanaugh type curve, so the second type curve is linear. So that's the content. For Barnaton, it's not true. Um, and yeah, so linearity basically means that the, the curve doesn't wrap enough right? So it doesn't wrap for more than three, 360 degrees. For example, this curve, you know, if you go at this point, it wraps for more than 360 degrees. Well, uh, perhaps I meant 180. Yes, I'm sorry. So this is a typo. So you see this wrapping, at this point, the, uh, the curve wraps for more than 180 degrees. And this is why here we have this change in the direction. And so the way to exclude this wrapping actually is to exclude, is to study fishtails on, on, the, on the curve. So you see that here we've got this fishtail and the fact that this fishtail is there is responsible for the, uh, you know, for this change of directions, but not not quite, you know, not quite as easy. Basically, the statement is that the fishtails has to have to cancel. So, for example, for the orange curves, one has one fishtail here and another fishtail here, and they cancel each other, and that's why the orange curve is linear. And whereas uh, for this curve, this fishtail doesn't cancel. This fishtail doesn't cancel with another uh, fishtail. So that's why the curve is not, is not linear. And uh, the interesting part is that for this uh, curve, there's one fishtail here, but then there's another fishtail as well. And so indeed, these two fishtails cancel each other. So indeed, this blue curve as again is linear and again fishtails cancel for that curve. 
So the key is to prove that fishtails cancel each other. And let me say that the proof is really very algebraic sort of on the twisted complex level, but I can translate it to symplectic geometry and uh, kind of uh, say uh, what, what really go, is going on on the geometric level. We don't prove it this way, but one can understand the proof from the point, viewpoint of symplectic geometry. And the viewpoint is the following. Basically, the fact that the Barnetton, uh, sorry, Kavanov type curve is a mapping cone on Barnetton curve allows to claim that Kavanov, that this immersed curve is unobstructed inside one, one's punctured sphere. So what I'm doing, I'm adding these three punctures back again. And the claim is that once I added those, the curve is unobstructed. And this is the same as saying that the fishtail enclosing three punctures actually cancel. And there is a precise way one can do it. One can prove this algebraically, but this, this is what is going on on the symplectic geometry level that if I add these three punctures back, my curves are still unobstructed. So the fishtails do cancel. And so I have five more minutes. So now let me address the other puncture. So here I addressed, so, I mean, it's really a sketch of proof. I didn't give you the proof, the proof is algebraic, but this kind of explains, this mapping code explains why it is unobstructed for, uh, you know, with respect to these three punctures. But the goal is also to prove that it is unobstructed with respect to this puncture as well. What happens if I, fill in this puncture. And that actually is really, turns out really much harder problem. Uh, for a while, we didn't know how to tackle this. And uh, recently we understood what's going on. Basically the idea is, is that uh, again, uh, we prove that this Barnetton curve is really an object of the Fuc deformed Fukai, deformed Fukai Kergo of a three puncture sphere, where we consider this uh, point as a divisor, which picks up variable u. And so really what we want is to construct an extension of this twisted complex to a different algebra, where this different algebra is an A infinity algebra. Uh, and A infinity algebra, because you know, when you remove this puncture, there is gonna be a disk in closing all these cores, and this disk is going to be responsible for a mu4 operation. And the mu4 operation will pick up u because it will kind of intersect this divisor exactly once. And it's gonna be u squared for formality reason, for, uh, you know, for grading reasons. Really, it's, it intersect, rectangle intersects the, uh, the star only once, but we record it as u squared. Uh, so this is just a rough idea, and I, the 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 question once you once we realize this, okay, but how do we construct this? And uh, so this was uh, kind of the question we were wondering for a while, and turns out the construction comes in two steps. Uh, I don't have time to explain kind of much detail, but let me say that uh, kind of the two steps are the following. The first step is kind of, uh, sorry, construction of another twisted complex over um, algebra A. And this construction uses metric factorization framework due to Kavanov and Razansky. And this algebra A, the key point is, is that it is a DG enhancement of algebra, of arc algebra B. And uh, uh, yeah, thanks go to Bollinger because he pointed us towards this Factorization, metric factorization framework of Kalanov and Marzonsky. So that's the first step, and this just comes from this paper. And then the second step is to translate this into this twisted complex. And surprisingly, this comes from homological mirror symmetry. So one wants to relate this algebra to this algebra. So one wants to do some sort of homological perturbation. And it is a it is a sort of a complicated problem, and it turns out it it was already done for us via homological mirror symmetry, 
um, for uh, basically potential x, y, z on a three-dimensional affine space. And using this homological mirror symmetry st statement, uh, which is due to Abu Zaid Oru, Yefim of Katsarkov and Orlov, uh, and also one has to use Orlov's, Ar Ar Arlov's interpretation of category of singularities using metric factorizations. So using all this, uh, one can deduce the necessary kind of homological perturbation statement that uh, DG algebra A is um, quasi equivalent to this algebra. And thanks go to Yanki Likili who pointed us towards this and these papers. Okay. And uh, yeah, so I'm over time already. Let me just remark that this actually kind of works in general and provides a natural A infinity structure or all arc algebras HM. Okay, yeah, so this, this was what I wanted to talk about this geography and connection to homological mu entry. There are a couple of slides about applications. So we did apply this uh, result to obtain, um, to obtain partial results to the, those two conjectures that we, that I talked about. But I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, let's give Artem a hand. Thank you. Any questions for Artem? Um, yes, I have a question. I mean, maybe I'll write it. Maybe I won't write it in chat. Um, so in the other theories, uh, you would expect that these kind of curves that you're getting are arising from some kind of, uh, as representatives of some kind of geometric compositions where you go through more complicated spaces. Yes. Um, do you have an idea for what these more complicated spaces would be? Uh, yeah, the short answer is no. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I, do, I also, I, I agree with you that well, basically what I would expect is that we sort of recovered here kind of the n equals two case for perhaps a more general uh, symplectic Barnatan homology. So I would think that there is a construction of symplectic Barnatan homology for, in, you know, for decomp uh, for n bridge decompositions. But I don't know what the what would be the right moduli space to look at. Maybe after the question session, we can have you know five or ten minutes and discuss this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thanks. Sorry, uh, I had a question. Uh -huh. uh, and you might have answered this in the last couple of slides, but um, can, can you say a word or two about how you see that the curve gamma sub kh is unobstructed after adding those three functors back in? Yes, uh, I, I, I didn't actually see, say that, uh, explain that. Uh, but yeah, uh, basically, yeah, so why kh is unobstructed when you do. Uh, the key idea is that, so K, gamma KH is a mapping cone on this. And then what you want to do, what you want to kind of prove is that if you have this gamma KH and another and the same gamma KH, and then, so basically the statement is that there's a morphism from gamma KH to gamma KH which can be described as identity times h. And because this curve gamma is already a mapping cone on h, this morphism is actually homotopic to zero. And then, and then, I mean, work in progress, this morphism actually corresponds to the count of fish tails. So that's, that's how it goes. But uh, as uh, it is a really non-trivial fact, uh, to pass from algebra to geometry, and it is a work, work in progress. But yes, roughly speaking, is that this morphism corresponds exactly to the two, the three punctures, adding those three punctures. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for Artem? 
Okay, so then um, let's call this the end of the formal question period and let's give our one more hand. Thank you.